welcome to another Round the Rotary podcast with me, your host, J.P. Warren, and thank you everyone for tuning in, and uh, hope everyone's having a pretty good day, morning, whatever it is, whenever uh, you're listening to this, and uh, before we get kicked off, i got to say that Round the Rotary podcast is brought to you by Capital, Patro- Capital Patron Consultants, CPC specializes in project engineering, well site supervision, and all disciplines of the oil and gas industry. Contact us through www.capitalpatronconsultants.com to see what CPC can do for you today. Like that? I like that. You got a, you got a, I dig it. I you got, dig it, you got, a, you got a podcast voice? Uh, we're fixing to find out. I definitely got a face for a podcast, so you can't see it, right? I, well, I guess we are. Oh, now. we're recording. Oh, we're okay. Oh, yeah, we're, we're recording. Yeah, we got, we got video and audio on. All right, this. all right. So for those of you that aren't really sure on uh, who's in the studio with us, why don't you, why don't you just chime us in uh, uh, who you are and your title and uh, who you with? Yeah, my name is uh, Chief Tozan. I work for Ranger Energy Services, and I am the Vice President of Sales uh, for all of our entities uh here at ranger and uh been in the business about 20 years i'm glad you glad you stopped by so we yeah. actually originally planned to do this in the summer we were the, the my wife uh, unfortunately got the rona back yep. in the summer so we had to kind of and you did you did you catch it i didn't i tested i tested negative okay and uh they're like you need to quarantine for 10 days and i was like i i don't think so i'm good I don't yeah i'm know. good i'm not staying in the house with her for well for but, 10 you, straight days. but you have to we, because you 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 talk to someone on the phone with covid oh, that's right yeah. so i went to the golf course and social distance there right did you improve your score at all well, my handicap's gotten a little better. Really? Yeah, it's gotten. You know what's funny? It's like you know during during uh, COVID and all that stuff. You're talking to all our buddies and all that stuff, and you know some people are just wind up at the house. Some people start boozing a little bit early. Yeah. Some people start doing this, and then some people start getting out and playing golf. That's right. I ha- I was fortunate. In my office, I ha- I've got an executive workspace, which is a normal office setting in Fort Worth, but uh, Rangers based out of Houston. But I had a an office in downtown, and it's really. Uh, I got a lawyer next door to me. I got another oil field hand, uh, Richard Thurston, who's down the hall. Used to be, unfortunately, used to be a lot of C and J hands down the road, but yeah, no way no there. Yeah. So uh, we know what's going on in the industry. Just sign of the times. But I always had a place to go. Uh, I got two young toddlers at home, a five and a six year old. Okay, so I was able to escape and and breathe a little bit. So uh, dude, I, was, I was talking. Nice. I had a. a, a lunch yesterday with, with a buddy of mine he got 183 rounds and the funny part is though that's not even the the the, the highest number that i've heard right there's a couple of cats oh, out yeah. there that have gotten no. over 200 plus rounds no i know customers that have 100 plus rounds right i mean so it's i mean it was great it was great for the golf industry it is it really was, it was you, everybody's like man you must be getting really good at golf i was like well until i take a lesson what else if but, i keep doing the bad stuff bad habits nothing's changed but what else are you going to do during those times i mean man. it's either you're in a woodwork i'm not a woodworker i'm not a gardener i mean you, you got to do something yeah I Definitely not a woodworker or gardener. Uh, a lot of things I, I didn't want to be when I was growing up. Marathon runner, I wasn't going to be that. I know that. No, but, no. But no, it was uh, it was one of those a strange year. You know, I'm a very social guy for those that, those that know me and, and like to be out and about. And, and and my whole career, I've always traveled two or three days a week, right? Right. Uh, for the companies that I've worked for, but. You know, for about the first three months, there was a time that you kind of had to adapt a little bit and figure out what in the hell are we going to, you know, how are we going to handle this? Nobody's offices were open. People weren't going to their office. No. So it was all phone calls and emails, right? It's still so, kind of like that. Was yeah. Like that. I mean, you were dialing for dollars and trying and watching the price of oil go to hell in a handbasket and rigs coming in and world uh, shutting down, world shutting down, coming to an end and whatever you want to call it. But, uh, you know, it like I, I keep going back there, like how you've been handling customers. At first, like I said, first three or four months, it was dialing for dollars. And some people would call you back, some people wouldn't. The ones that would, I, I finally figured it out. If I if I have their cell phone in my phone, then more than likely mine's in theirs. Yep. So they were always pretty receptive to that, uh, that or even emails, right? So uh, for me, uh, and I think probably most, uh, is... You re- I really leaned on the relationships I had in the business. And that's what's literally carried uh, Ranger back to to above the board, so to speak, compared to where we were on the bottom. But that was the important part about, you know, relationships. People are talking about, you know, networks, network, network, networks, and all that. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's you know, obviously it's crucial. But, I mean, during that time when things were hit hard and, and you know, things shut down, people stop, you stopped seeing people, whether yeah. it's breakfast, runs, office visits, whatever that was. If you didn't have those relationships and you didn't have that network, then you I felt you were behind the times, and it's, it's, it was an uphill battle. No, you really were. And I, I always wondered, man, it's like some of these guys, uh, newer folks into the industry or, or may not have been around as long, and, and uh, you know, how are these guys, how are they going to handle this whole environment that we're in now? Because you can't build a It's hard enough as it is to build relationships in this industry, and it's even particularly harder to do it 
in that type of environment, yeah. right? So uh, you you got to have be very self motivated, and you have to be really disciplined. Uh, we all have the good days and the bad days. Going, what am I going to do today? And it gets pretty redundant. It gets redundant. It gets kind monotonous. Of, I mean, it's just almost ground. I call. I told somebody the other day, man, it's like Groundhog Day, man. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's it's some days just some weeks go by quicker than others, but you got to find a way to, to kill time. I found a lot. I had to, I finally figured out. I went and got a golf membership, and uh, and played a lot of golf. Started playing a lot of golf, and customers were very receptive yeah. to that. I mean, I was probably about summertime when you everybody get your own was, card. You can do social yeah, you can social yeah. distance and. Uh, and it's been great for me. That's the way it's worked. A lot of coffees outside of the office or, or lunches, perhaps. Uh, and uh, it's just been a it's just been a different way of doing things. I've been accustomed in my career, uh, from a social aspect. That's the way the majority of my career has gone in building relationships. Has not been between the eight to five, so to speak. Right. right? Professionally, yes, but the true tried and true relationships that you build with people have been after five or. You're right. Some cases after three o'clock. There you go. Or there you maybe go. after lunch. You, well, you got to the th- get there at three o'clock to to, that's beat, right. to, to, to wait till traffic dies that's down right. till seven. That's right. That's exactly right. So, man, why don't you give us a little uh, a, a quick background on yourself, kind of uh, where you've been, um, um, uh, first generation, second, third uh, generation oil field, and kind of bring us to speed, kind of where you're at today at uh, at uh, you know at Ranger Energy Services. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I am second generation. My dad, Johnny Tozan, he he spent uh, had a. a a 30-year career at Amico okay. Production Company. And he took his early retirement before the, the whole BP acquisition, if you will. And, and uh, he went on and took a few years off, went to work for H&P and helped those guys out. But also had an uncle in the industry on the service side, Ricky Tozan. Okay. Uh, and he spent his career mainly on the fish and tool side of the business. So I had two great role models, so to speak. Uh, Did you want to get in the oil field? You know, when I was in college, you know, I wasn't – I definitely uh, – it's like a Mike Moore told me one time. He's like, yeah, my, my oldest boy, he graduated magna cum laude, and the other one graduated, graduated oh, good lordy. So that was me. <laughs> so uh, I was on probation most of my college career at, uh, at Louisiana Tech. However, my, at the time in the late 90s, I got out of Tech in 99, but uh, in the late 90s, the industry wasn't very stable. There wasn't a lot, a lot going on. It wasn't very favorable. So for- what did you go to school to study? Well, I was an ag business. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Bus- general business, agricultural business degree, right? And uh, so my dad's like, when I got out, he's like, you, you know, if I'd prefer you not do it because he saw the the trials and tribulations of, of what my uncle went through on the service side, right. and obviously him knowing a lot of people, what was going on in the late nineties, right? So uh, he's like, you know, I have an engineering degree, right. so you need to try to probably find something outside outside of the industry. So I did actually. I went to work for Rush Equipment and uh, John Deere, okay. yellow iron dealer, uh, for about a year or so. What were, you, what were you doing there? I was just doing sales, work behind parts desk, stuff like that. It paid good. Yeah. I mean, out of college, it was it paid better than than other places. So, so did you always want to get into sales, or is that just kind of? You know, I think it fit my personality. You know, but to be honest with you, and you may laugh at this. I, you know, growing up, I was always pretty. I wasn't real outgoing, honestly. I was always pretty shy. Dude, I, if so, you can believe that. My, so I asked my dad the comparison between you know my daughter and uh, and and me, and he's like, "Well, you were a lot more shy." Me? Oh, I was very reserved. I think probably what changed my whole personality or, or confidence in, in being able to talk to strangers, uh, when I went to Louisiana Tech, I lived with my grandparents on our farm up there. So, And I commuted every day. All right. And it's so a feed cows, play golf, go to school. But I went into an environment where I knew no one, right? And in and playing golf then in college, I walked into a, a place where I didn't know anybody. So yeah. I was forced to start have small talk conversations very, with just total strangers, right? And they knew some of my kin folks there, but it definitely that's kind of when I probably had to come out of my shell a little bit. I okay. think I was forced to, honestly, uh, and uh, and that kind of led me down that path. Even when I was at Rush, uh, answering phones every day uh, for we were they're a yellow iron dealer, John Deere yellow iron dealer were then. But a lot of phone conversations, right? Constant, and you start you building more and more confidence with talking to complete strangers, right? right? And then you ultimately develop relationships with those guys just as well as you would any other sales role. Right? What was your perception, I guess, of the oil field? I guess growing up when you when you when you're your dad, yeah. and your uncle, and what was your I guess perception? you know my, so for my dad, you know, I didn't really uh, we 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 were very fortunate to do it, go on a lot of great hunting trips, fishing trips, et cetera, et cetera, and I have great memories of doing that. Uh, I had a, I had a, my uncle was probably my role model and, and anybody that knows Ricky and, and, uh, 
uh, all, all the oilfield life he lived back in the day. You know, he was my role model, right? right. I was telling you earlier, I've got a picture of myself and when I was probably four or five years old, set of red coveralls, overalls, boots, had my Frank's Case and Crew hat, Craig Corbell Sr., oh, rest in peace, yeah. actually it was a, a vendor of my dad's at the time. Uh, and uh, yeah, do you know Craig Singer? Isn't it, isn't it amazing? Kind of like the generational, yeah. like just like you know, like oh, this is you know my dad. This was his dad. And, like, yeah, it's just kind of like it's kind of cool how the the Oldfield family has kind of uh, grown up and kind of shaped into kind of the it, same relationships. No, it really has. You know, my dad was very instrumental in my career, particularly in the beginning. Yeah, from a, a relationship point, you know. Uh, after I left Russia, I went to a little small consulting firm called Luco, actually, between there and my time before going to Tesla. What did Luco do? Luco is pretty much just what you're, what you're doing today. So you Capital. went to a compet- So we don't have to talk about Luco. Yeah, we don't have to. Let's keep going. We don't discuss we don't, so competition. Did, yeah, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> so that was a short period of time. Uh, ha- had a great opportunity there. I did get into the oil field there. Paid more money. That's what I was doing. I was 22, three okay. years old out of college. Sorry about that earlier. but. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, got an opportunity with Tesco, and that's really where I got to, to spread my spread my wings a bit. But circling back to uh, the influence through those relationships, yeah. my my father's reputation, if you will, or last name between him and my uncle, quite frankly, opened up a lot of doors and opportunities, right, right. Uh, for me at that time, and very grateful for that. However, back you know, turn, I call it turn of the century. When I was in sales in Houston at Tesco, it was all gray hairs, right? right. I mean, I was—I bet there wasn't ten salesmen under the age of forty then, right? All of all of Houston. Oh yeah, I mean, if you wanted to go interact with a younger customer, you had to go to Exxon Mobil on the thirteenth floor, uh, and that's where they had supply chain and some of these young drilling engineers, their training, whatever they were doing at the time, right? Was it? I guess it was that generation. I guess when you when you got in the oil field, when you moved to Houston, first got into sales. Uh, I guess your First proper oil field yeah. sales role. Yeah. Was, I, was the, I guess, generation, the older generation, just because kind of what, what, what got hit in the 90s and no one really was an attractive industry? Or yeah, what? 80s, 90s. I, you know, I don't think, I think there was, uh, a, you didn't have the engineers. They weren't doing that in college, right? They definitely weren't studying petroleum engineering. There wasn't a lot of engineers coming out. A lot of schools, even like Louisiana Tech, had gotten rid of their engineering, I petroleum actually, engineering. I actually lived with a uh, with a petroleum engineer my, my last year in, uh, in at A&M, and I think his graduating class was like I don't know, but I feel like it was like 12 or like five or something like that. Now it's tremendous. Oh, yeah, no doubt, right? I mean, obviously, everybody's chasing the money, too. They know what the potential is there right. to do that, especially in the, you know, let's call it 2009 to 15, right? It's kind of when the crew change happened, yeah. if you will, right? But back then, I mean, the only way you networked, I didn't have, it was very difficult for me to form relationships with guys that were 30 years older than me, 40 years older than me, you know? So for me, uh, at the time, you know, you're going to AAD luncheons, IEDC luncheons, SPE luncheons, maybe a clay shooter cooking at a golf tournament here and there. But in those environments, you had to, you'd go in there and you'd sit down at the petroleum club at a table and it's complete strangers, right? So you're forced to have conversations, and and uh, but it allowed you to build a network at the same time. Sometimes you'd be at a table with, with two operators or one and maybe... You may be at a table with all service hand. Right. right. And, uh, and now there's financial advisors. Yeah. Then now there's finance, a lot of suits in there, right? Financial yeah. advisors. You so. start talking to someone, chiming into someone about 30 minutes, get that relationship going. And it's like, hey, let me get your card. You're like, let me get your card. Oh, you're a financial yeah. advisor. Son yeah. of a bitch. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> so it was just a different time and place, you know. And then uh, very fortunate after I, you know, I left Tesco, which is a great foundation for me. We, we did a lot of great things there right. technology wise, which kind of molded the way I look at the industry as a whole technology wise. Uh, and thinking outside the box, they were they did a great job of doing that. Mike Tassari, I was Mike Tassari's dad, actually, Bob. So, yeah. who uh, just no big deal, but he just passed 500 downloads on uh, around the rotary, the the, the largest download uh, episode yet. Yeah, but he was one of the first. Oh ones. yeah, yeah, yeah. He was no, one of the first one. I knew Mike when he was in college, right? So, really? Oh yeah, uh, he was a little. He was a. Uh, he was a. Uh, I'm not going to give a description. He was a little heavier than he is now. Oh, right? he showed me pictures. When he was in college, he was in a band and all that stuff right there. But I'd walk back in the shop, and there'd be Mike back there, you know, smoking a heater or yeah. something. You know what I mean? Back so, in the day. Good, good dude, though, man. And oh, it, he's one of the best out there. He really is. And it, it formed a great relationship there. His dad's a great man and pioneered a lot of great technology for the industry. And I was glad to be a part of it because it's it's essentially like air conditioning now, right? Right. Top right. drive. So, did, so you enjoyed, I guess, I mean, you're, you're kind of the – 
the younger generation stepped yeah. in. I mean, there's no other one kind of on your age demographic or anything like that. So, I mean, did you enjoy it, sales? I mean, what, what was it like for you, I guess? You know, I did. I, I enjoyed it. I've always in, engaged myself in being very close with the operations side of things. I enjoyed the sales part of it and building relationships, talking to people. And, uh, you know, I'm very competitive by nature anyway. Yeah. So, uh, at, at, you know, throughout my career, whether it was working for myself at Chief Oil Tools, wherever it was, uh, I always had a lot of ambition to, to be competitive. Uh, and, to get, and that got me out of bed every morning, right? Once you kind of taste that, get a taste of any type of success, it re- I feed off of that type of stuff just like anybody would. Right. It feels good. Right? Yeah. I mean, it feels good. It, it feels like you're doing something right and it's working yeah. and you get the momentum. And then once you figure out what, what works for you, then it just... You keep doing it. it's repetitive, right? Right. Uh, and you you take some things along the way though that you that you have to adapt to. You know the industry, like in 07, 08, when I uh, you know when I owned my own deal, uh, Chief Oltels, I came. A lot of that work was done and sold at the field level, which I, I love the field. I love going to the field, but I came back to Houston uh, to work for for Stallion. Yeah. And uh, that was a gr- turned out to be a great move for me. But at that time, that's kind of when that crew change occurred, right? And a lot of young guys showed up, and I guess I would have been. Let's do, let's do the math here. I'm 44 today. However old I was, 2008. So that was yeah. So that was kind of when I guess you know that's that's when the the, our mutual I guess contacts and friends. Because I think I think in the I got in the oil industry in 2005, but I was doing HR, then HSC, then you know I wasn't. I I didn't get into marketing and sales until 2011. Right. So seven, eight, everybody showed up. You know, a lot of younger guys, and I had a lot of obviously had a lot in common with those guys. And man, it was. uh, you know, barring the the banks collapsing in in 08, 9, and the industry took a dip, but it, luckily it turned around fairly quick. But uh, it was a lot of fun. Oil ramped up, you know, all the way to what 120, 40 dollars yeah. a barrel, and and uh, it was just a really to- oh, it'll never time. be the same. And uh, I definitely missed the days of. Uh, you know, nobody was at at the time. You know, nobody was married. Nobody had kids. They didn't have any any home to quite frankly didn't have any responsibility uh, of significance other than to stay employed. Yeah. And and back then, it, you know, at one hundred forty dollar oil, it's pretty easy to do, right? You wake up, right? That's all you got to do. <laughs> you know, that's the playbook. You there. wake up, but we got to develop a lot of relationships, man. And uh, it, it was the best time of my career, and, and developed relationships and friendships. Not only with with sale, other sales guys, but uh, customers that'll just last a lifetime. And that's what I love about our industry. That's probably the most unique about any other industry or business out there. The relationships that you take and the network you build, and and how small a world it really is. Uh, kind of like I was telling you about at the time when I went to Pennsylvania, early part of the. Well, tell that story. I mean, tell that story. Yeah. I've heard it, but our listeners haven't. Yeah. So, uh, two thousand two, three, something like that. We went up to uh, to the northeast. Uh, this was before the Marcellus Shale, right? Right. Uh, and we went up there to put some equipment to drill coal bed, the seam coal bed methane uh, seams, horizontal wells, lateral wells. And uh, so anyway, we go up there. We're meeting with one of the drilling contractors up there, and we're going around the table introducing ourselves. And we get done, and the guy stops. He goes, "Man, I got a question for you." He goes, uh, "What'd you say your last name was?" I said, "Tozan." He goes, "Man," he just kind of sat there for a minute. He goes, "He goes, do you know Johnny?" <laughs> And I'm like, we're in Uniontown, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, whatever state it was. I'd never been there before. I know that. And I was like, yes, sir, that's my father. And I'm like, he goes, did he work for Amico? I said, yes, sir, he did. And he goes, man, he goes, talk about a small world. He goes, I was a derrick hand for your father. I think it was Delta drilling or something like that. In 19, I wasn't even born, right? I was That's not. Insane. I was not. They drilled the deepest vertical well in Pennsylvania at that time. Yeah, I like guess nineteen thousand feet or maybe even mm-hmm. longer. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I was blown away. Right, just crazy. But that just kind of shows you. It's like you know, in our industry, obviously, it's the relationships that matter. But it's also the name. You know what I mean? Your yeah. name is probably one of the most important things yeah. in our industry because our industry talks. You know, it's it's it we it's you got to put a good name out there for yourself. And the fact that, you know, your dad's name stuck with this guy yeah. for X number of years and you walk in the office. Yeah. You know, you're, you got to make an impression. Right. And, and, and going back to some of that, you know, I also wanted to create my own identity, too. You yeah. know, uh, you know, you kind of get caught in some of the shadows and that which you're grateful for. 
Uh, well, when did you realize you kind of had to create your own identity or kind of do your own thing? Because, I mean, a lot of people think they can hinge their hat on, oh, this, you know, my dad did this, yeah. my mom did this, my yeah. dad did this. Yeah. So when did you kind of realize, like, okay, it's time for me to kind of branch out. It's kind of it's time for me to make my own path. Yeah, I would say it's probably two or three years in, you know, throughout the process of everybody's career, you're going to always have those places where you're, you're growing up, right? right? Especially when you're starting out and, and working and paying bills. But... Uh, and trying to you try to find your way in the world and you lean on those and you really don't even know how to lean on them so all you have is your name right but i would probably say 2003 or 4 when you finally catch your stride and that's when i had enough confidence to go on and do my own thing too right right uh and then probably even more so created a brand for myself i feel anyway was probably around the, the time of the crew change just because you had all those relationships to create that you know to create that you know uh so I would probably say full bore. I probably finally caught my stride eight, seven, eight. I would think. And so, what did that look like? As far as I guess, finding your own stride. I mean, was, was that just kind of you kind of get yeah, your I own think groove? It's just, you get in your own groove. You build confidence. I think it's right. Everything's about timing in this right. life, right? And it's where you're at, time, place, who you work for, what kind of culture they have. How do you fit into that? You know, when I went to work over at at Stallion. Uh, I was, after I'd sold my equipment for at Chief Oil Tools, I'd actually, I had a lot of opportunities, right, uh, to go work uh, for various companies, but I wanted to make sure it was the right fit for me and that I could impact their business the day I walked in the door okay. or before I walked in the okay. door, quite frankly. You know, once you say, okay, you're coming on work, you're going to start January 1, uh, I, I had I had jobs sold before I even walked in the door, right? So just say, pick up the phone, you know. Uh, and also, I felt like I could really lean on my relationships, and it was going to be a good fit for me. Uh, and I was able to, 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 to do really well there. It was, it was a great, great move for me. You spoke about, uh, before we started a kind of recording, getting up behind the mic, you, you, you spoke about, you know, you, you went in Stanley and kind of built a team there. And, yeah. um, you know, big shoes to fill. I mean, you were right. there before Mike Moore. I was. He's one of the best guys out there. He really is. He was. I consider him one of my my dear friends and mentors. So you so you come in and you got to and you got to build this team. What is that? What did that look like for you? This is the first team you built. I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah, we inherit. I inherited some of the, some of the people. We had a lot of great guys there, uh, and I've always been, a, you know, been attracted to a lot of the elder statesmen of the business, so to right, speak. And right. we had some elderly guys that I personally leaned on and learned a lot from, because uh, it was kind of a new role for me too and responsibility. But one thing that I really really liked was uh, I was able to hire some young guys, uh, you know, like Spitzenberger, Greg Spitzenberger, Kim yep. bringing them over there, Gabe Jack. Jackson, who's been on here before, oh, yeah. you know, uh, it was one of those things where if I saw guys out where I was at, because I knew what I was doing, I knew what my habits were and where I was going, I would, those were the kind of the guys that I picked. I was like, man, this guy, is, he's getting it, right? And, he's, and he's, he's, he's working hard. He's playing hard. So it, it wasn't uh, one of those things where people are like, you know, sending you resumes. And was, if anything, you were actually out there you know, boots on the ground, you're, and you're noticing people's work yeah. ethic. You're, so you're watching too. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely paying attention to that. And, uh, you know, it, it really worked out. And, and those guys, it's all about hustle and work ethic. I've always said, you know, unfortunately it's not that hard to outwork an oil field salesman, quite frankly. Right. Uh, I've always been one to, you know, obviously this environment's a little, a little bit different is to stay engaged in the operations and be at the office or around that operation engaged, whether I had appointments or not, right? right. All the way to five o'clock, you know, for the most part. And I always encourage those guys to do that because I think you build a, a pretty good rapport with those folks. Because oftentimes and you there's, get there's some always, great opportunities. Because oftentimes, you know, it's always the the age old sales versus operations, operations yeah. versus sales. You know, it's like you're on the same team, but you're off. You're, you're trying to, you know, push your own push your own agenda, whatever that looks like. So I think establishing those relationships, not just with the customers or salespeople, but just as you were saying, the operations, the 360 relationships. Yeah, yeah no, that's very important, right? I think I, I learned for some reason, I, you know, I, I adapted that mentality a long time ago, you know, probably just from the lack of knowledge, quite frankly, uh, you know, to be able to learn and inject myself into the conversation, even if I was just listening. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it was, you, you seem to develop, it's just like anything else with, with, with a customer where I think a lot of people uh, may fail or sales guys may falter is not building a relationship with your operations guys or a, a building trust or a rapport with those guys, right? right. So uh, they would lean on me just as much as I would lean on them, you know, at the end of the day. And 
I think that's a lot what's missing, not only even at the sales level, but also uh, just the world we live in today and the models that are out there, you know, uh, service company wise, right? Well, we're going to get into that. I want to yeah. finish the, the the background, then let's talk about this, yeah. the, the the models that we're that sure. we're seeing that we saw in the past that we're kind of that might we we might see in the future. Yep. So you're at Stown, you're building this team, you got yep. these young cats that you've noticed that are hustling out there working. Um, sorry about that. That are out there working and hustling. Yep. So you enjoying that? Yeah. You're, you're enjoying the oh, yeah. team being successful, and then and then. Yeah, I think building building that you kind of see guys grow, right, and kind of catch their stride, and uh, you try to guide them the best you can and give them advice. Uh, the best that you know how that you think is the right way to do it, right or wrong. Everybody's got their own will, but you know, you kind of have to have a little bit of emotional intelligence, if you will, you know what I mean? To kind of learn what's going to, uh, how people are going to, what's going to motivate those guys, right? right. What's, how are you going to get the most out of those people? And I've really enjoyed that, not only there, but even when I came to Ranger, uh, went into an operations role. I was in sale, VP of sales, and then we got to go move to Fort Worth and, and be a VP of, of Mid-Continent. And so your entire career was sales before this. It was all sales before, yeah. But because of your um, ability and want to learn and have relationships with the operational team, and all that, that's how you kind of got this position to go into operations. Yeah, so we we had acquired a company, and, and I was kind of part of the integration by, I would say, even default for the most part, because I had gone up there in a sales role just right. to introduce myself, hey, can I help, whatever, blah, 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 and then they asked me to move into that role because I had kind of built a rapport there. So uh, so we went up there, had to had to make some, you know, obviously decisions to, to, to build the business right. and, and rice and change the culture coming from a, a smaller family-owned business all the way into the corporate world what is a publicly traded company in ranger but you got to really influence those people to change that i mean we're talking about uh you know even just introducing laptops to some of these guys right on how to e-tickets everything like that but you had to be real influential and that was the most uh fulfilling part for me is uh not only changing the culture but trying to create a pathway for people to have a career. And if people right. see that you actually care and that you want to do this, because a lot of times after an acquisition or after a merger or something yeah. like that, there's always the, the the culture clash. And there's always the, it's a different culture that's being acquired. And then the ones that are acquired, they hate change. They're thinking, oh, they're going to come here. My job's going to my job's gonna be, now it's going to be completely lost. Uh, yeah. And there might be some, if you don't successfully engage and, and change the culture the right way, there might actually be the point where it's actually sabotaging. No, the there's no doubt about it. And you got to be real careful, careful with it. That, right but I think the most important thing is really listen to your people no different than you listen to your customers right uh, you know the internal challenges are a lot harder than any external challenges with your customers may ever be right and I mean because if your house isn't in order then you can't deliver the that's product right. that you want that's a, that's it's gonna be a disarray but uh, I've really enjoyed my time where I'm at now and being able to mold people and, and kind of influence I wouldn't say their life but their livelihood and create that sustainability there Obviously, 2020 made it difficult for a lot of people, so uh, which is unfortunate. But uh, but it's been good, man. It, it really has been very fortunate, and blessed, and, and enjoy what I do every day and being around people and look forward to the doors opening a little bit. So you were in, you were in operations. You went up there and kind of had a, had a, a successful uh, successful culture change implementation, whatever you want to call it. So what, so when did you got, I guess get back into to uh, sales? Yeah, so they moved me back into sales back in uh, twenty uh, January twenty twenty. They're like, come back in, let's go build a oh, let's okay. go let's yeah, pretty recent, right? Yeah. So uh, let's come back, let's build a team because we didn't really have a big a big group. So let's go build a team. Got one guy into it, and then COVID hits, right? God. So. So that's, here but that's something you can't. I mean, no one ever, no one planned for that. No, you know, no one planned no, for that. No, no. So, so but it's all good. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about kind of this, this, this the world we're living in today. We got a couple good uh, points that we discussed before to kind of jot it down on stuff. And you, and you, we were discussing, I guess, the the, the previous model in the oil and gas industry, yeah. right? Whether it's the, the the executives not being informed, making the wrong decisions, you know, patting themselves, whatever, whatever that yeah. looks like, or yeah. loans being extended for companies yeah. that are not making any profit, not making any money. Right. So how are they still in business? So yeah. the, the, let's talk about the old model and kind of what, 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 how it's broken and kind of what, what, how you see it, I guess, fixed or the new model, I guess, emerging. Yeah. I, th I mean, I think moving forward, it's everybody's got to be, uh, you know, be fairly lean. I think the old model, I mean, if you look at it through the consolidation of the businesses over the years, that has created a lot of that problem too, though. Right. And they're making those acquisitions when oil is a hundred bucks, and everybody, $100 a barrel or gas is eight, eight, you know, 
eight dollars, whatever it is. But uh, you know, one, you're paying a premium in the good times for something that, quite frankly, you know, you times only have to get better for you to. to I mean, people make money in spite of themselves, right? When times are good, right. and people are paying premiums for that too. So they obviously they're taking on heavy debt loads, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, they're creating these these layers upon layers of you know management groups, and then you look at the boardroom, and you got private equity guys in there, no offense, but you got private equity guys that I get it, they have to have a seat at the table. And then uh, with all due respect, you've got a lot of guys that their time is so, you know, let's so-called past, right, right. I guess, that have been out, uh, not engaged in the industry for 15, 20 years, and they're playing armchair quarterback. And then you got a CEO's trying to cover his butt, getting bl- smoke blown up him from the 10 different layers below him, right? We just talked about that. And they're trying to save their job, right? Yep. And it just it's just mis- uninformed decisions, right? Uh, and your employees suffer below – everybody else below that suffers, right? But, that, but that's what you talked about, having relationships and listening. I mean, if you get some of those older people at the table or you get some private yep. equity people or the C- – or CEO, yeah. you need to have those relationships. So there are those. Uh, so first off, you understand what's going yeah, on. Yeah, you get rid of the layers, really. It's more about engagement, employment, right. employment engagement. Uh, and I, I really feel like a lot of operators will want that, I would hate to call it boutique type of feel. But the quicker you can make decisions, the more efficient you're going to be able to be, right. especially if it's the right decisions. And that's what operators want it, want it to feel like versus – having to go buy a car. Well, let me go talk to my manager. You go back and forth, back and forth. Let me talk to the finance guy. Let me talk. Well, we could have done this five hours ago. I know. Right? That's, the, wor- know that's the worst part. It's, it's, the, it's the length of, of, of a decision being made. Yeah, I think that's what's missing in a lot of places. Uh, and it's probably, by, you know, it's probably to their own failures, that their, uh, their own demise, that people just aren't engaged, right? And that's got to start at the, at the highest level to be engaged and have conversations to help understand what they're – what what's going on in their world? And day. if anything, then this day and age, conversations are more important because people have gotten very comfortable behind the computer, behind a screen. Oh yeah, right now, and it's it's one of those things. You know, twenty twenty. Obviously, people are taking a break. They're at their house. They're they're not having those conversation face to face conversations. And then the the phone conversations kind of start dropping too. Sure. So we'll just do email. We'll just do oh, LinkedIn yeah. and all that stuff. So these conversations, I mean, now more than ever, it's crucial to kind of set things right, get back on the right track. So what do you kind of see the new? Like, do you see this changing at all though the, i guess the... i really don't see it changing that drastically it's never going to be what it was right i mean i think that's the reality no i'm talking about the new model oh the oh that new model, the new model. Talk, oh yeah, the yeah. new model i think some there's some people out there that are that are adjusting to that yeah i think 2020 has forced them to do that now the it's always the overcorrection just like anything else uh in this business there's always overcorrections one way or the other oh, yeah. right? so very knee-jerk are people, I, you know, more than likely the, most companies today with what they have, I mean, outside of probably your bigger operators, uh, but particularly service companies, I, outside of your, your labor in your field, uh, I would think that most of what they have in place today, they should be able to sustain that for the way what the industry is going to look like in five years, right? This industry just keeps getting smaller and smaller really and does. smaller. I mean, you look at the 80s, four or 5,000 drilling rigs. Look in the 90s, that's get squeezed. You get in the 2000s, uh, let's say 2008, the rig count gets cut. There was 2,000 rigs running then, uh, or in, all the way to 15. Now there was 1,100, and then we go back into 2020, then now there's 400. I, I, don't, I don't see how – a lot of that's driven on efficiencies, too. Efficiency, and, and, technology. And commodity prices yeah. have helped that all in all, but the, the technology that's out there today uh, – you know, it, the the way wells are drilled now is essentially assembly line, right? I mean, yeah. they're just doom, doom, yep. doom, doom. manufacturing, I guess, is probably the better way to do it or, or to, to, to say it. But uh, it's going to continue to get smaller. I mean, it, it just is, and, it, and history's proven that. And uh, with the way things are today, not to get into politics, but the way things are today, it's going to continue to to get smaller, right? Why? Why? Because of politics. Well, we can the get regulations, into it a bit. yeah, the, what, what they're striving for. However, I, I've always been pretty bullish on gas, right? Yep, Natural yep. gas is something I've, I've been pretty bullish on myself personally, and that's just from kind of seeing what's going on in the world and around the country uh, on how we. It, it's ultimately the bridge, in my person. This is my opinion, <laughs> uh, but it, I think it's the liter- It's it's the bridge to what let's call it the federal government. What they ultimately want to 
what the narrative what the, what the narrative is, right, or what they think they can achieve. But it's it's not going anywhere, right? But that's the thing that we but that is this could definitely going to be the bridge. But we until need, they say something that and identify that at that level and say. And why, I don't know why they, I know why they don't want to say it, but that's what's going to have to happen to help move that market, right, or that commodity. But let's talk about that. You and, I had, you and I had a kind of interesting conversation about this, the whole, uh, you know, fossil fuels, renewables. We, we, we kind of kind of got into that, and that's, you had a great point. I mean, you, you discussed the bridge. I mean, they're, neat, they're, I guess the way people want to view it today is that if we had the choice, we could just flip a switch and go all renewables, oh, but, yeah. but the, we're, that's it's not reality. No. The, the there needs to be infrastructure, there needs to be technology, there needs to be a way to capture the energy. So that being said, I mean there needs to be a bridge from where we're at today Definitely. to kind of where that looks like. Yeah, no, there's no doubt about it, and that's why I say natural gas is probably the cleanest, most uh, uh, affordable form of renewable energy out there. I'm not saying I'm not opposed to having other pieces of it you're going to have to have everybody in the room on the same page and and recognize that that we're all providing energy that we're all doing it right i mean there's 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 pros and cons of this one pros and cons oh, of this yeah, one pros yeah. and cons of this. so it's it's one of those things is let's not attack you know the oil and gas industry let's just it's we're at the table there's no two tables it's yeah i mean in the oil and gas table. industry it seems like you're always on the defensive right yes. for the most part yeah in texas maybe not so much but well, dude, uh, we, just watched, of, we just watched that uh that's true the big you know, family you can't run from it right yeah i just uh so i just showed a, a, a chief a a little four minute clip that uh that i got from this movie called bigfoot family on netflix i was watching with my daughter um and wife the other the other weekend and there was nothing subtle about how the oil and the gas is evil. There was nothing, yeah. there wasn't like read between oh, yeah. the lines. Yeah, I think, you know, I know the industry as a whole, we de- you know, I don't, I don't say we got to do a better job, but it's just, un- again, it's uninformed, right? right. I think, and, and I know I've heard people say we've got to do a better job of educating people uh, that are, that view the world or the industry as what we saw right. on, uh, or in a bad way, yeah. environmentally, whatever the case may be. But, uh, but the same token, are you going to get them to actually listen? They've already got a. They've already uh, made up their mind. They've already made up their mind, and it's just in, in one ear out the other, right? And it's just blank stares, and you know, there's it's it's a challenge, man. Well, that's the thing that we're watching. I was showing you that clip and all that stuff, and that CEO of that uh, the the extract oil company, yeah. or whatever on Bigfoot thing, he was saying like, oh, you know, no zero foot zero footprint. Da, da, da. He was saying all the right things, right. and once the cameras are off, then he switched. So it's one of those things. If you are sitting with someone having those conversations, and you do yeah. leave the room, or you you're te- speaking to a class of kids and all that stuff, and you leave the room, they're thinking, okay, well, he just said exactly the same thing that this villain said in this this kid's movie. That's right. I don't believe him. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the way the world is today, uh, just socially, the way it's interacted, the way social media, whatever you want to call the narratives by different news outlets, if you will, even, and then you throw politics in the middle of it. It's It's a shitstorm. It's a shit, it's a dumpster fire. It really is. It really is. And the thing is, though, is it's just as, you know, you were saying that you enjoy these, these, um, conversations that that conflicting conversations. Yeah. You enjoy these discussions. Yeah. No, I definitely do. I I mean, look, I'm not going to take any offense to it. I may get I, I don't mind defending my yeah. ground on it for sure, but I, I can, I, I'm not opposed to hearing somebody out, right? The older I've gotten, I've gotten, my wife's going to disagree with me about this, but I've gotten better at listening and right. being a little more patient and a little more understanding uh, for other people's views. But hey, man, they got to do the same thing, you know? But, but uh, again, we live in a society where it's you got to choose which side you're on. Yeah, but there's and there's the a end. lot of there's a there's a there's a middle ground. There. Yeah, there's lines drawn in the sand, right? There's no compromise. There's no gray area, right? Right. And uh, and it's just going to continue to be a bigger challenge as, as they move. I say they as uh, the narrative, if you will, from a regulatory standpoint, is going to get continue to get more pressure on it, right? right? Or our industry is going to continue to see that. It's, it's, we're going to get a lot more heat, and it's going to continue. I mean, uh, Jim, I read something from Dan Pickering that uh, Jim Cramer, I guess, said, you know, it's the end of oil, you know, EVs and all this stuff. It's like, where are you going to get the yeah, get electricity? Yeah, where are you going to get that from? Yeah, that's the whole mystery. There's a huge, disc- there's yeah, a huge, a huge disconnect, you know, and, and, and shame on them and shame on us. That's I right. Mean. No, it is. It is. And that's why I say, how do we get out and, and, and uh, get it in front of those people that do oppose or look at it like that? Easy. Right? Get, get, out of, get out of our industry bubble. Get out there and make a friend. Make, make, make yeah, friends. I mean, make, be, get, be friends with a, with, with a, a, a liberal or someone that would oppose Yeah, I mean, points. the thing about it today is if they, you know, the world we live in, unfortunately, you disagree or if they disagree with your views, then. Oh, 
oh, they're they're an idiot, they're a cuck, they're yeah. this or that. It's like, man, you, I, I, dude, I, if you can disagree about whether it's a sport team or something like that and still be friends after, I mean, you should be having it. And that's the thing. Like, let's get out of the bubble and actually make – you know, communicate with people outside of our industry. That's right. You know, no, make, make friends, make yeah. friends with them. No, I agree. I think there's some organizations that are trying to do that too, yeah. though, right? Yeah. And uh, uh, there's definitely plenty of them out there. We probably obviously need even more of them. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like I was saying earlier, I think probably our generation, or our generation, Generation X, whether it's in the oil and gas industry or just as a whole, you know, there's kind of a gap there, right? From a representation and being out in front of what's going on in our industry, uh, and I've actually thought about doing something, even like talking to Mr. Slocum a little bit with what he's doing yeah. with his situation, and kudos to him for doing that and bringing it to the forefront. So the abandoned orphan well, yeah, the orphan uh, well nonprofit stuff. that he's yeah, working I mean, on, which is is huge. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I, I think there there's definitely something to that, and uh, and he's doing a good job getting a lot of momentum behind him. And yeah. he's, he's 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 it's a plan. He's attacking it, and uh, and it's he's promoting it the right way. So kudos, yeah, obviously. Well, he hadn't been afraid to do it. Right? No, that's, exactly. That's, that's the biggest part of it. He's stepping gotta, out there and, and just getting into it. I kind of want to shift it to to to, to kind of talk because you have, you're always one of those people that has, obviously the reputation precedes them. You got a great reputation about about uh, establishing relationships and, and, and becoming friends with people and all that stuff. And uh, and I want to talk to you about that kind of. Uh, how do you let's let's talk about building relationships and what actual relationships are to you in your opinion yeah i mean it's really you know the true relationships I me mean, professionally is one thing right you yeah. know the between like i said between eight and five you go in there you go in there with a purpose you visit it's mainly work initially uh but you know for me it's really about you know it's, it's cliche but you're you know getting into their personal lives you know you know you got a i feel like you got a good relationship with somebody whenever your customers even asking you well how are the kids doing et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, and you, work is always the last part of the conversation. Right. Or if it even comes up at all, quite frankly. Yeah. I was in a customer's office yesterday, and I, quite frankly, you know, obviously we couldn't cover some of their work, but I went over there solely just to talk to those. Yeah. I mean, because it, we, and they're, I actually got to go in an office, like their office, what? right? Yeah. That, what? Their office. So that's, uh, that's, I'm not going to mention any names. That's something to turn. They know who they are, so I'm not going to do that. But, I mean, it was about an hour long of just catching up, well, that should talking be- about the industry, talking about life, talking about, you know, obviously two weeks ago, uh, Arctic blast, whatever you want to call it. But, yeah. yeah, man, it's just great conversation. You can really lean on those. To me, it's one of those things where it's like if you're not talking work or once you conclude work, is there going to be – empty spaces and be dead air. I mean, yeah. are, can you fill that with actual conversation? Yeah, that's right. I mean, even even outside of that, you know, outside of the 8 to 5, I'll be honest with you, I want to hang out with people that I have that type of conversation with. Yeah, right? yeah. You know? Or that comfort level of to not feel any pressure to even talk about because they don't want it. You know what I mean? Those customers don't want to feel that pressure. I, that's why I say, I, man, I'd be surprised if they open any of these offices back up. And I was, I mean, they, they probably, they're getting spoiled right now, right? Yeah. I mean, and I don't blame them. I always wondered even before, or even now, and it's probably worse now, how do they filter all those phone calls? How do they filter all those emails? Even though it may be a technology that they're not using, yeah. I mean, obviously they're going to feed off maybe a, a network with other operators in the field, but at the same token, you know, you just never know. Those guys, uh, man, they they got a tough road to hold to uh, to handle all of that right now. You I'm know? Th- I'm th- how you how you filter it, how you handle it, right? But I'm, I'm talking like how like. In the world we live in today, I mean, the, the right. relationships are built. You're right. It's not built when you're sitting there, you know, behind a computer shooting email across or sitting there across the desk in a professional oh, yeah. setting or anything like that. It's done outside of work. And yeah, definitely. I think there's a, you know, since, you know, you know, you know, Kelsey Dean coming on and starting Snap, you know, you start and crew, y'all start and crew yeah. change. I mean, these, um, and, and honestly, like I, I support AADE, I support, you know, the SBE turn, I, I support those industry things. Okay. But that being said, those aren't on a regular a regular enough schedule to have those relationships. No, you're right. You're right. Those are months apart. Those are months apart. So I think it's important to take it upon yourself to either start something or, or, or do something that gets people out of the office, yeah. that uh, that gets people away from their desks and all that stuff. And you, you can engage in more of a social setting. So those relationships are I'm just like you. Yeah. You know, the customers come to my, you know, 80% of my daughter's birthday party was customers, you know, right. two years ago. Sure. You know, and it's, yeah. it, I should have expensed the thing. Yeah. You know? yeah. And, then, uh, and then my wedding, too. You know, I you know all my customers, yeah. you know, I had a couple no. of customers show up, and it was, it was it's, it's great having those relationships. No, it really is. I've, I've been forced to have the same situation, and uh, there'll be friends of mine for the rest of my life, whether I work in the oil and gas business or not. Exactly. Right? You know what I mean? 
So, and, and it's also one of those things where, you know, even for sales guys or, you know, calling on your customers, you know, uh, there's some of those people that don't, there's a lot of people that just talk to the, their customers only when they have work. Right? When, or when they're picking up a rig. Or, or when they're picking up a rig yep. or something like yep. that. Right? Eh, that's not really. That's very transparent, you though. Know. There was a a buddy of mine who, uh, you know, got a divorce, and uh, I think, you know, I forget what year, got a divorce, and next thing you know, you know, he's getting phone calls. You know, he got a ring, oh, yeah. he's getting phone calls. And, he got, and I remember I was in his office, and hit speaker, and it's like, hey, man, like, you know, how's the wife and all this stuff? He's like, well, got divorced two years ago. Like, yeah. thanks for checking in on me. I yeah. mean, that type of, that type yeah, of, I mean, it's, it's, it's transparent. Just, no, I agree with you. And, that, you know, even just simple text, you know, and obviously the, everybody is uh, – has, has got their own lives and yep. their daily lives and habits and, and you got to make a living but you know it, it's not that difficult if there if you had true relationships true friends there uh, then you take the time to do it right it may it's never as frequent as it should be right but uh, but I think and, and we all probably aren't the best at that sometimes I mean I'm guilty of it just as well but you know I do a lot especially just driving a lot uh, is whenever I kind of start scrolling through and Calling people, and yeah, just, and just check and just, and just shooting the shit. It's a yeah. wellness check. That's yeah. right. That's yeah, right. how things how things going? Yeah, I kind of wish that you that you, that you'd see like these the, the, the when I say the younger generation, the people I guess who you know just got in sales or kind of yeah. building their career. I kind of wish you would see more of those. Um, uh, whether it's crew change or snap or some yeah. another creative name, we did OPEC. You know, old man. Yeah. Uh, was it oil, oil field people eagerly consuming? I mean, I remember we started yeah. that, and we had just you know, customers coming out, just and it wasn't kind of an organized thing. It was like, hey, we're going to be here, show yeah. up. Yeah, no doubt. That's one thing that's missing. I'm not sure it needs to happen. I mean, there may be some uh, what YP or whatever they have. They yeah. may. I don't know if they do that. They now. have AAD next event, but that, yeah. but then again, that's all once a month. It's all sales, which is important yeah. to have your sales network. Definitely, no, definitely. That's one thing that. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't lean it. You can't do it all by yourself. Right? Yeah. And that's one thing where I probably failed even work for myself is not, I depended on myself the whole time. And I was successful with it. However, uh, you know, coming back into the corporate sales world, uh, you really lean, you, I mean, if you're going to work in Houston, you're going to have to know, you're not going to do it alone, right? I think the bit in this industry the, as a whole, the, but especially in in city of Houston, I mean, you're city not, of Houston's a shark tank. It is the, it mo- is. the most. You get more um, industry knowledge, and you and you get to, I guess, expand your network more with customers by your sales buddies. Oh, no doubt. Yeah, no, there's no doubt about it. Somebody knows somebody better than you do, right? Exactly, you know? exactly, and that's where you need to leverage your your, your right. relationships with your sales. And right now, that is the only way it's going to happen, right? You know what I mean? I know for me personally. Uh, Work-wise, the work we've regained off the bottom of the of the downturn today has been nothing but those old relationships, right? And network, for that matter, quite frankly. Uh, so now, in the environment we're in, there's haven't been people haven't taken the opportunity to figure out how to do that. Is there a perfect way? I don't know, but you need to take advantage of every opportunity you get, whether it's the golf tournaments that are still going on, the clay shoots that are still going on. I mean, uh, shoot, we've had we've we've done a, a gumbo cook outside. You know, it's like, hey, we got tables, you know, spread out. Like, oh, yeah. swing by. Like, you, you just try to do what can work. You know, and if yeah. and if and if you're not certain if it's going to be very well attended or very well executed, who cares? Just yeah, do I mean, it. we've even done sporting clay events that aren't even industry related. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? They're not a industry sponsored event. It's just an event. Yeah, um, it may be some local charity thing, right? But. Uh, and, you know that's another way to do it too is look outside that. So if you were so if you were getting into sales right now, or let's say you're starting off in sales right now, what I guess what would you see as having the most impact uh, right now to I guess build your networks and expand I guess uh, to deepen those relationships with people? Yeah, I mean for, I think right now you, it's obviously going to have to be something outside. Outside golf has been one of those things for me as I mentioned there, right? And, and trying to get out coffee, you know, like I said, that was probably one of the first offices I've been in in a long time yesterday. That could be but, a good selling point. You say, hey, look, if you don't give me the next job, then I'll just tell people that your office is open. That's that, right. That'd be a good selling right. point. That's right. That's well, always we tell- had the people that I could probably tell them that. That's what I always tell people. It's like, hey, I'm like, hey, if you don't, uh, if we don't get this work, I'll, uh, uh, yeah. I'm gonna, sell, I'm gonna yeah. tell them that you're picking up two Unleashed rings. I'm gonna give your cell phone out. Yeah, yeah get ready, buddy. <laughs> but no, yeah, it's uh, man. Right now, you just got to do un- turn over every rock and figure out how what's going to fit you best, right? But right now, you're pretty limited to that. Though, yeah, right. And I would. Actually- I mean, you can get out. Everything. All the businesses are opening back up, so that should help. 
You know, in the state of Texas, they are anyway. Wednesday, right? Yeah, next Wednesday. Yeah, so, so, we're, so we're recording this on uh, March 4th, and I guess next Wednesday, uh, Abbott ordered uh, yeah. everything open, no mask. So I'm looking forward to seeing, like, uh, there's going to be the content of videos that are going to be out there between maskers and anti-maskers. It's going to be great. Oh, it's yeah. going to be great internet. It's going to frustrate a lot of people, but it's going to be entertaining. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, you wear your mask about ten minutes out of the day most of the time. But it's not. It's almost become a habit, though, right? It, it, yeah, it kind of has. It kind of has. But dude, there's gonna be there's gonna be so much conflict. Oh, oh yeah. Or, people telling people how to live. Well, regardless of uh, again, not gonna touch on the the political side of it, but regardless of what what happens, right? There's gonna be a lot of that. Uh, uh, which which camp are you in? Yeah, which camp are you in? Uh, and how can I tell the other camp that they're wrong or they're an idiot or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I'm off the hundred percent opening opening all the businesses. That's the most important thing to me, right? I, it doesn't bother me one way or the other. I don't have to wear a mask, but I'll probably continue short term. Maybe I'll I, do it short term. I didn't get the Rona, so I, I haven't uh, knock on wood. Uh, haven't got it yet, so. And that's the thing is, like you know, you 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 wear a mask, and I'll probably you know wear one too, you know, yeah. until until I, things yeah, kind of calm down. I, a I know I will. Because here's the deal: people are like, oh, you're st- scared of it. It's like, no. First off, like it's not that I'm scared of it at all. It's one of those things. It's like, I don't know if you know me. If it's allergy season, I'm out. You know yeah. what I mean? It's yeah. like, okay, like I am such a yeah. baby when I have a like oh, yeah. a little bit of not even a cold. Yeah, you're laid up. Yeah, I don't want. I don't want yeah, to. You'd get rather it. be hung over than sick. Right? Oh my! Well, yeah. this day and age, when I'm 40 <laughs> years old, no, I don't think I'd rather be sick because I'm a baby both ways. Yeah, I hear you. But that's the thing, though. It's like you're gonna have all these people telling people just you know just. Try to hold your opinion. Yeah, like, who no, gives that's a shit? To, who no, gives a shit? I agree. It I mean, you see someone with a mask, someone with Who gives a shit? Yeah, it doesn't bother me one way or the other. No, not at all. Not at all. But, um, shit, I was that, uh, talking about that. So, no, you, you had a point about kind of the business opening uh, up in, uh, in um, uh, I guess, we could kind create of, some opportunities there from a network standpoint. That's right? okay. That's that's kind of where I was going with thank that. Thank you. Yeah. Go on. No, I think it definitely does. You, you know, your bars, restaurants, particularly the bars, probably. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think that serves as an opportunity to do that or to start those back up. I think that I, may have one time. And, However, you know, you look back, it's the industry actually is not as social, even pre COVID, it's not as social as it once was. You're right. You know what I mean? I can remember there were about a 10-year stretch where it was – you had a place to go every night if you wanted it. That's right. I mean, you really did. There was Tuesday you Capones. There was Tuesday oh, Capones. Yeah. I'm talking an industry – it wasn't industry sponsor, well, I guess technically it was. But it wasn't like a formal event, but it was like Capones on Tuesday. Steak night at uh, the Tavern on Wall in West Gray, which I don't even know if it's there anymore. It's not. It's apartment complex. But, uh, but, you know, you just get in those habits of doing that. But, I mean, back then it was nine days a week, right? Yeah, but now, this day and age, it's, I mean, people have responsibilities. People don't understand, don't feel that there's a We've benefit. We've gotten a little bit older, you know. It, uh, I've got a little grayer. It's got a lot, a little more mileage, got, and maybe a little more uh, responsibility. And maybe, be, maybe people don't understand the benefits of, of going attending these things. And, and 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 I actually kind of would advise people when next time you do sit down with a customer, I mean, it's not a waste of time, but try to talk. Don't try not to bring up work. Yeah, you know? no, that's no doubt. With like yesterday, with, man, it was just free flowing conversation talking about. Anything and everything, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. I, I, I would employ people not to discuss work. You know, and that's that's one thing. A guy, John Henry Johnson, who I worked with, uh, you know, he told me one time, and he was, I was, he was reporting directly to me, but you know, he had a really good point and probably some advice to to a lot of sales guys, especially because you're always going to have good days, you're going to have bad days, you're going to get in these slumps, you're going to get, you know, things get monotonous and. You get really complacent when oil's good, and then you get when prices are good, and then everything's busy, and you get real complacent when things are slow, like in 2020, right? right? So, uh, you know, moving forward, depending on how the office settings are, but one thing he told me that I, that really that that really stuck with me is like when you're having a bad day, or having a bad week, and you're in a funk, and nobody will see you. There's always that one or two customers that will always be down, be down to do whatever. Yeah. And you need to do it because it kind of resets everything. You have those conversations. You kind of get the blood flowing a little bit. You feel a little bit productive. A little more productive, laugh, cut up, do whatever you do. But there's all, you always lean on those relationships. There's always going to be that customer that you always go to, not even to talk about work, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? But if you're ever in those, those type of situations, mentally and not motivated, pick up the phone, call them. Let's go get a bite, go get a beer. 
whatever. Get out of the house. Just get out of the sit. house and just go sit and talk to them, right? And just it's just really just a mindset more than anything to kind of get you out of that funk. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, but I think it's, that's it's easy to fall in a rut these days. No, it really is. Yeah, it really is. and that's kind of really it's, complacent. It's, We've all done it, right? I mean, everybody. If they tell you they haven't, you're lying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, it's you know, as a sales guy, you, when you first get into sales, you do the breakfast runs, and it's easy to be like, eh, I don't have to go there, I don't have to, do that. and then you start getting in that kind of oh, yeah. complacent Groundhog Day kind of rut where you don't feel like you got to kind of get out of your That's box true. or eh, I got, I'm doing account management, yeah. I don't need to call on this new customer. Sure, no doubt. So, um, what do you? I mean, I guess I guess with you know, things are kind of it feels like the industry is a little more optimistic right now. Yeah. You, you hear about potential activity coming up, and, and you're seeing this. What's kind of getting you excited about? Uh, I guess uh, moving forward. I mean, we got through the shit storm of last yeah. year. Actually, it's been full twelve months since COVID. Right. What are you kind of looking forward to in our um, uh, industry, or, or or just kind of personally? I guess moving forward. You know, moving forward, I think you know, for me is uh, you know. I kind of have some, I'm really, I'm not saying I'm concerned, but, uh, the, you know, obviously oil, you oil, oil is, oil is it, it, there is, there is, is it, uh, is it going to be this price at the end of the year? I don't know. Right. OPEC's got their meeting coming up to see what they're going to do with all their stuff. Right. I don't know what day that it may be today, but, uh, or next week, maybe I'm keep, not keep sure. Keep chatting. I'm looking it up. But anyway, uh, I think you get through the first quarter and kind of see what the lay of the land is, but I mean, it's again. I go back to the overcorrections of our of our business, right? I mean, still there's there's 400 drilling rigs running. Uh, the 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 growth or the U.S. oil production is not going to be maintained through the drill bit. I don't believe unless commodities continue to improve. Okay. But with that being said, as they continue to improve and rigs are added, drilled and completed, you know, then you kind of create your own. Uh, demise. Right. We, we, I hope we're not back to where we were. Right. We've got to get a little more discipline as an industry, I believe, uh, to to have a, a balance. I right? kind of feel like sustained we are. balance. You know, the conversations. You know, in twenty. But is it? Is it? But is it? Is it? You know, part of the inflation piece, though. Right. I mean, all things considered. So that's so. I remember twenty eighteen. You know, uh, you saw. Activity. I don't know. I don't have the answer. I don't have the answer. But you saw activity. You know, uh, before. You know, uh, you know, operators would carry their rigs. You know, if they had a drilling program for the year till you know October, November. You know, then December was kind of regroup, and then Q one again they could get back yeah, out there. Right. I think in twenty eighteen operations kind of slowed down for the majority of the customers. Probably around August, and you started hearing this conversation: positive cash flow, positive yeah. cash flow, kind of a buzzword, yeah. right, in our yeah. industry. And then, I, you know, from there, you know, we went up, and then boom. Uh, COVID hit. Yeah. All right. Everything crashed. Everything crashed. I do feel like these conversations about off operating in a profit mentality, you know, this whole flip model, this private equity flip model is, yeah. is kind of over. So you are seeing these new conversations emerge about it. So I'm kind of hopeful for that we're not going to go back to kind of shooting ourselves in the foot. Yeah. I'm hopeful there in that respect. I'm just hopeful that, that uh, from a service company standpoint, that man, I'll be honest with you, there hasn't been any consolidation, so to speak, relevant. Okay. I mean, the number of consolidation on the service side, I don't believe there's been enough of it. I think most people will probably agree with that. Haven't seen it. I don't know how, you know, I think there's still a lot of people putting pressure on vendors f from a rate perspective. Yes. Right? Yeah. Uh, and that's the thing. You know, and I may make a lot of operators mad when I say this, but the, the, the challenge is, is, you know, oil goes from, uh, when when oil started going the wrong way, pretty quick. Yep. What it took a week to get rate reductions, right? Oh yeah, and it was, it was, a, it was a, yeah. So since the election, oil was thirty eight bucks, I think, the day of the election. Since then, it's up what twenty bucks, right? Plus twenty as high as sixty three. And it's difficult to go back the other way, right? No, that's... and I'm, it's it's a little bit concerning with because there's still. A little bit of heat on the, the right side of the pressure. There is, and that, and I remember in twenty, what was this, uh, seventeen, twenty, whatever. I mean, every everything was cut. Twenty sixty, everything was. All the prices were cut. All the prices were cut. Yeah. You know, flat, drop it twenty percent, twenty five percent. And then when things start getting picking up and things start getting busier. Those you're right. Those rates never went up. So I mean, for a company to and it's like, well, you gave it to me this rate at this one time, but yeah, we're also through our relationships doing you. We still need to make profit. We're, yeah. we're, we're not well. The wages we're not charity. Well, and the other thing, it's always just having having the right balance 
of the rates and the wages for for your labor force yeah. right that's yeah. kind of the problem because when we came out of uh the 15 16 but let's call it 17 come yeah. back show up back then well you still had wages that were uh still at 14 wages let's call them 20 percent higher yeah. and then you had rates that were yeah. still suppressed right right you know what i mean so it's just got to. There's got to be a way to balance that out, and and uh, it's just tough conversations, right? Yeah, I mean, it really is. Uh, I'm not sure it ever changes. But. And no one, and no one wants to have those conversations that you kind of need to increase your price. Yeah, it's stuff tough because there's man. fear of losing it's it tough. to go to the to go to a low, lower it's bid. It's tough. It, it really is. And I like. I'll be honest with you. I like to, you know, going through those conversations to be very transparent. Yeah. I mean, you you literally have to spell it out for them. I mean, you have I mean, to be. Otherwise, otherwise they're just going to assume that. I mean, it, 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 you need to have those conversations. Otherwise, they yeah. understand what kind of where you're coming from. Yeah, definitely. I mean, everybody's got a job to do, right? Exactly. Exactly. I, I, I get it. You yeah. know what I mean? Uh, and they're never easy conversation. As sales guys, sometimes you you know, you know, just want to get it done and keep the work sometimes, but you still got to be profitable, right? Yeah. And that's kind of a big problem we've always had in the industry where uh, people intentionally putting out work and losing money. And that's and that, and that just hurts everyone. Yeah, we've been pretty disciplined where, where, where we're at at Ranger, so, which is, I feel like it's done pretty well for us. So. Well, good, man. What else you want to, to, to get into? Man, you tell me, dog. Man, you, we're coming up on a, uh, an hour here of this, uh, yeah. this conversation. I know that you and I could probably chat for, uh, what, what else? What else? What else? What, what's kind of keeping you up or making you wake up in the morning early? You know, I get up, believe it or not, uh, I get up and go to the gym. Okay. I get up about four o'clock. I got some good, good. Uh, well, getting up early started with the kids. Obviously, getting up in the middle of the night, and I've carried that on. Get up, go to the gym, whether it's swimming or get on the treadmill, maybe bang some iron or something like All that. Right. You can tell I'm getting a little buff. Okay. But uh, I haven't been back to the gym. I, mean, I just, I just, uh, you know, you, the COVID happens. Gym's closed. You think I'll oh, just do a little. One thing right I now. do miss though, I really do, and I hadn't taken the time to do it because I have the time now to do it. Is, you know, I used to do a lot of saltwater fishing. Okay. Growing up, and also, uh, you know, did redfish tournaments, professional redfish tournaments from Texas to Florida, right? Uh, the FLW, ESPN, the Redfish Cup, all that stuff like that. Did that for about eight years. But uh, the, the Texas coast is something uh, near and dear to my heart, and that's always been a passion of mine. That all turned into to a job, right? Yeah. At one time, you know, the tournament trail stuff did is an expensive hobby. You can't make it's not like bass tournaments where you can make a living doing it. So got out of that, forgot about what, what it was like to, to fish for fun, yeah. you know, and started doing that. And then uh, I've been fortunate to spend a lot of time in Guatemala, actually, on the on the billfish side of things. Okay. You know, Jason Gast, he's yeah, been down the, there. No, he's familiar. So a little plug on that. Andre he, Futch, all those guys. Jason Gast puts a great uh, a program on. He came in and we talked about yeah. pretty much the entire time this Texas billfish classic, which helps, you know, yeah, he's done veterans. It, it's, it's, and, it's, and it sounds like such an awesome tournament. Yeah, no, it is. In Guatemala, man, that's I, I, I tell my wife, I was like, man, I want at least half of my ashes spread over the Pacific Ocean in Guatemala. That's it? Yeah, oh, it's great, man. Selfish capital of the world. Is there nothing like it? Well, it's one of those things you get out there. Your phone's not going to work. Good. One. Good. Uh, but it's one of things where you can just, when I mean unplug, I mean, whether you're catching fish or not, but you're going to catch fish there. But you can literally just unplug, and it's just, uh, I mean, I, I'm infatuated with water to begin with, okay. right? I've always been a, I love to be on the water, man. It's there's and nothing like it. You know what? Talking about that, I mean, that's that's interesting because I know that feeling about you know, like it's you're doing something fun, you yeah. know, and, and you're doing something fun, and you're, yeah. oh, customers, oh, doing yeah. something fun, 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 and then eventually you get to a point where you're like, it turns into uh, the enjoyment's gone. Yeah, you know, it's no, like, it turns into a job. Yeah. Right? Like I say on the when we were fishing all those redfish tournaments for however many years, and we had a lot of success doing it, but. It literally just turned into a job. Yeah. Right. It yeah. was a grind. Supplies. It was, oh, it's grind. Well, you, you know, if you're going to be, if you're going to compete in any of those, you're there for a week at every venue you went to. You're away from home for seven days. Luckily, I was either working for myself or an employer who uh, helped sponsor or promote that or right. allowed me right. to do that, uh, you know, 10, 15 weeks out of the year. You know, in a, in a short period of time, we're talking about from March to about September, October. And that is a grind. Oh, dude. I mean, it, it was a grind. It was a lot of fun. It's the competitive drive is what keeps you in it. If you have any taste of success, like I said before, for me, it just feeds the 
feeds the uh, the addiction to it, right? But it's good to take a break from that sometimes. Oh, man. So to, to like, you know what? Like that's don't get me wrong. It, and that's a thing. You know, people are like, oh, boo hoo. Like you have to go yeah. fish. But you're also not oh, at yeah. your house. You're yeah, not, you're not. You're, you're living not with out your of a family. Hotel. You're living in a hotel. That's right. And this might be a week for you. Oh yeah. This is the fifth week I've done. This. Yeah, you're getting up every morning, you're spending all day on the water. Sun's beating you down. Wind's beating you up. Water's beating. And you, you up. have to be bullshit. You got to yeah. be. You got to be on on point. That's right. And then you know I can. And remember, I don't know when it was. I guess it had been, I don't know what year it was. But I can remember going. On a, we went on a just a fun trip to Cocodery, Louisiana, and I remember we were wade fishing. I was like, golly, we didn't catch anything. And I'm like, this is nice. Yeah, this is what it's like to fish for fun. Enjoy it again. Oh, yeah, game changer for me. That's when I said, I'm out of that deal. Yeah. No. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, you don't want, I mean, if that's what your enjoyment, you love being on the yeah. water, and if it turns into work or something you're kind sure. of dreading, the time you need to part, that's when you got to kind of separate and kind of like, I guess, get the, get, the, uh, get motivated. Yeah, right? get the juices flowing, right? And that's yeah. that's one thing I look forward to with things opening back. I don't know how the customers are going to react as far as their offices are, but I think you'll see a little more uptick of some of that social activity or interaction with your customers face to face, I think. I yeah. feel like there'll be some of it. It's, it'll probably never get back to what it was. Uh, but I feel like it's, I, I, you know, talking about getting excited about what's going on in the industry there. Uh, I think there's, you have that to look forward to. It may not even be this year, but. And that's, I mean, honestly. It's, but it may be next year. And it's one of those uh, things, like, because everyone has their own, obviously, risk factor when it comes to engaging, sitting around uh, a table with someone yeah. or getting in front of someone. Everyone's got their own kind of risk factor and all that stuff. And hopefully, you know, through the, through the, the, the vaccine and through, you know, things opening up again. I guess, um, and hopefully the, the vaccine kind of we have. There's enough out there for everyone yeah. that wants it, you know. Yeah. Which it sounds like there is. So hopefully sure. that kind of reduces the anxiety about actually joining and shaking hands. And yeah. It's 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 a weird feeling to be a people person, be an extrovert, and oh, get man. charged up off of people, and not shake hands or not share a laugh or share a story. Or not know if you don't need to fist bump, shake hands, yeah, just, it's, elbow, it's, it's, whatever, it's, it's, right? It's kind of a, it's a weird feeling. It's awkward. Yeah. yeah, it is. It really is. It is. And uh, yeah, but at the same time, you got to be respectful of everyone's risk. Yeah. Fact. No, that's it, what it all boils down to. And respect their opinion on how they want to handle it. Yeah. That. Like it's, at the end of the day, it's how they want it. I don't give a shit how they want to handle yeah. it. Yeah. I don't. No. It doesn't affect me. No, I agree. I'm not going to go home and, and have a 35 minute heated conversation with my wife about how someone else is handling the uh, the pandemic. You know, that's just me though. There's other shit to talk about. No, I agree with you, man. I agree with you. But no, it's all good, man. I, I, you know, you got to really step back sometimes. You t- it, unfortunately, it takes events like the Arctic Blast here a couple of weeks ago. It, it really makes you think about, and you get out of it real. You forget about it real quick though. But it really makes you appreciate a lot of things you have in this life. You know, yep. whether it's your family, running water. roof over your head, running water food on the table, et cetera. Uh, you know, it, it, I, I wish it ever, it's human nature to kind of, you get back to normal and you kind of, kind you of go, slips your memory. You reset to how things were. Yeah. I wish you, you know, you could just get to a point where it's just like, yeah. you know, keep that same mindset moving forward. And it's hard to do that. You know, and that's one thing I do love about Fort Worth is, is just the pace of life. I love Fort so Worth. different, man. I got the shortest commute of my life. It's a, it's a great city. Oh man. It really is. You get each 35, it, it's a little, little more traffic, but, uh, that Del Frisco's, uh, a restaurant. double Eagle. Yeah. Double, it's beautiful. Yeah. You, know, you kind of feel That's like walking cool in place. with a six shooter and shooting a cowboy on the top of the ba- banister, sit down and get a drink. Yeah. Funky town's a good place, man. It, it, I, you know, it, uh, it doesn't take long to get across town it's uh, some good people. It's just a, such a slower pace of life, and uh, I've definitely enjoyed. It. I miss I miss the people of yeah. Houston, but I I really don't miss Houston. At I don't. All. I don't. My th- parents are in Pearland, so I mean, I, God love them. Fort Worth but, is great. Is a great place to live. I mean, yeah. if I could hang my hat somewhere, it'd be. I would be. De- that'd be definitely one of them. Yeah. No, would, Fort Worth's good. But that's a good point, though. You know, it's 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 you know when things kind of you know go back to whatever it looks like. Yeah, it's it's one of those things. It's easy to get caught up in your old mentality. Oh, I gotta, it is. Gotta get back. Gotta get back. I mean, it is. And you kind of lose focus on what's kind of important, or or, or what's what's you know what's keeping you happy That's when right. you're always chasing something. No, there's no doubt. And I, you know, I'm pretty. I feel like I've you know the goals I've set for myself are somewhat ambitious. Are they realistic? I don't know. We're gonna find out. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But you feel like you just, I had uh, drinks with a friend of mine, Bob Ryan, who I worked with, and, and he's one of, we call him the Renaissance man. Just very well traveled. He's a lawyer. Okay. But just very open-minded guy. He's one of those guys that you just absolutely love to sit down and have a drink with, or drinks with. And, uh, you know, he listens. 
yeah. I guess. Yeah. But he's got just such great stories. And it just talking to guys like that just put such a total different view on the world, you yeah. know, yeah. sometimes. And, uh, man, what a pleasure to, to be able to, to just slow things down and not be caught up in what you think. Think you want. Yeah, think you want. That, or think that's going to make you happy, right? And that's the thing. I mean, I was talking to I, I did this uh, uh, podcast. I, was, I, I don't mean to interrupt. I, I was telling him, though, that exact same thing. Like, he's like, you just need to take care of your health, take care of your kids, you know. Slow down. Yeah, because, I mean, we were talking about the frustrations of the COVID deal, right, yeah. where everything's so restricted. You can't get out and see people customer-wise. Right, right? He's right. like, man. Don't sweat that stuff. It's, out of your it's gonna come. Yeah, it's out of your control. Just, just do your deal. Don't let it bother you. You know. You, and I, I'm looking. I'm looking forward to things to open yeah. because there's a lot of small businesses that have been crushed. You know what yeah. I mean? I That's mean, the unfortunate part. Right? And I, I think I want them. I mean, look, if yeah. you want to wear, if they require a mask, cool. That's great. You yeah. know, I mean, if if they if if they don't, that's fine too. But at the same time, give them a chance. Yeah. Give them a chance. Yeah. I'll tell you one thing: the government's not helping. Oh no doubt. No doubt, I agree. <laughs> Don't get me started on that, buddy. That's a goat trail, but, there, buddy. But the thing is, though, it's I do appreciate the because you know during COVID, during the quarantine, and all that stuff. I mean, people were locked in, things slowed down. People realized, man, I kind of wanted that title. I, I, I was sitting with a customer, and he was very focused on his yeah. career, very focused on raises, very focused on title, very focused on next step. Oh, the. the I, uh, I I chatted with him. He goes, you know what? I don't even want to go back to the office anymore. I, I'm 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 kind of well. That's fine. the whole thing. I'm kind of fine where I'm at. Well, it's I, a quality of life thing, and I can to say that for the first time. Now, granted, my kids are six and five, but I always say for the first time in my life. But I'm not traveling two or three day, three days a week. Right. Uh, now that I've moved back into the role that I'm in now versus the operations role, you know, this in 2020, I get to wake up and to this day, I get to see my kids every morning. Right. I get some days I get to pick them up from school, yep, or take them to school, yep, and I get to see them every night. You can't beat that. I mean, what am I complaining? About? Especially at that age, you know, maybe when they're teenagers, that's when it's like, yeah. all right, I got to start traveling again. But I think right now, I mean, it's, it's such a great age to do that. Yeah. And there's a lot of times it's like, well, through, uh, I got to go, I got to go, I got this, I got to, yeah. go, I got to go. Just chasing the carrot, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. What is it really all for, right? Exactly. You know exactly. what I mean? So that's all. I, I've, I've definitely enjoyed that, man. Put a smile on my face. I mean, you've got a daughter. And uh, I've got two kids that I know of, so. Uh. <laughs> I got one that I know of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, no, man, I appreciate you coming in, kind of sharing your thoughts on kind of uh, your career and kind of uh, the old field the way it was and kind of, uh, you know, where, where it needs to go. Yeah. Hey. No, no, no. No? Oh, you can interrupt. No, I interrupt all the time. I'm a bad interrupter, dog. Dude, my wife says that about me all the time. She's like, maybe you just let the guests talk a little bit instead of interrupting like you do at the house. Like, I'm like, I interrupt that much? She's like, well, you actually, I was like, I do? She's like, you just interrupted me, asshole. So I'm like, all right, gotcha. I got you. I'm bad. I apologize. Oh, I'm horrible at it. No, but uh, you just did it Here we go. We're doing it. You did it. No, but I'm saying, I I, I appreciate, you know, you coming in and, you know, telling us about your career and kind of telling us what kind of where the oil field you believe uh, should be going and kind of just sharing thoughts on just having those relationships, having those conversations, uh, get in front of people and talk about something besides work, talk about their kids, talk about something because that's how you build those bonds. That's right. And I, you know, I was telling you earlier, you know, tell you that I'm I'm proud for what you're doing, proud of you for what you're doing because the reality is, is, you know, there's a lot of different podcasts out there that probably, I mean, they're good. They're informative, right. but sometimes can be taken a little too serious or too serious in the conversations, right? Yeah. Uh, and one, and then everybody is, you know, allowing a guy like me, a sales guy, right, so to speak, or the many other guys that you've brought in here. Oh yeah. That actually give those guys a voice because you go to most other podcasts, you're not going to see Chief Tones and VP of Sales no, or whatever. You CEO know, this, COO that. It's, you, you know what I mean, right? So uh, I think it's a great platform. And uh, and that's why I wanted to do it. Did wanted to do it last summer, but I mean I think it's a great kudos to you, man. And it's kind of Thanks, a free flowing conversation. It's kind of with the hair. You kind of the Howard Stern, of the, <laughs> Howard Stern of the Oil Field Podcast. You know? Ooh, uh, uh, but it, 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 but it's been or the fun. Joe Rogan's but, it, but, the, said. but that's the <laughs> but it, but that's the thing though. It's been one of those things where it's like. It's just like content. It's just whether it's a social media content or whether it's you know a company content or it's, or it's, whether it's a podcast or or whatever. I try to do stuff that I would want to listen to. You know what I mean? And I think you know there's some people that do want to listen to the market forecast, the technology stuff, and da-da. that's not me though. You know that's not my style. I I love everyone's got a story in the oil field. Everyone's got you know an outlook. You know everyone's got opinions. Everyone's eh, 
And that's kind of why this started. It's like, man, you and I have spent some great times around customers on, oh, the, yeah. on the tee box. Yeah. We've had some great conversations oh, with yeah. our customers around a dinner table. No doubt. And it's just one of those things like, well, shit, man, I know that guy. And, and, and he's, he, you don't know, oh, man, he's got a great story. So it's kind of a cool, I guess, platform to have everyone kind of come in and just chime in. Tell them what's going to No, it really is, man. I look at your, the guests that you've had from the early days to where they are now. I've got a lot of good friends. Yeah. Frustumers. Frust, frust, what do you have? Frustumers. Frustumers, frustumers what customers. you call them. I mean, you know, uh, it's really fun to sit because living in Fort Worth, you don't get to see those yeah. people, right? Or hear, or, you know, and talk to them as much. So it's always nice to see that and, and happy for a lot of folks that have that have been able to come on here, the, whether it's their own personal brand, regardless of what their intentions are coming on here. Uh, we've had you've people. given them a platform for that, whether it's me to talk about Ranger Energy Services or whatever it is, right? Yeah. And uh, But you... Try to stay relevant. That's all you can do, you know. And that's something, yeah, we've had, you know, J.D. Smith come on and bought a coffee shop in Bolivia. Yeah. And yeah, we, yeah. Talk, we talk, we talk oh, yeah. coffee the whole time. Marshall Brown opened up a coffee shop in Houston. Talk of that. Uh, you know, uh, Colton uh, Bingham, who just had that crazy traveling story. We didn't even talk oil and gas. Right. You know what I mean? But these are the stories that I want people to hear because it's, it. first off, it's great industry. It, it creates great, and that's big to yeah. be industry advocates. Sure. Like, obviously, we discussed that. It's, yeah. it's promoting our industry, promoming the people in an industry as not being this tight cast stereotype that That's that right. the narrative is doing we are we are your neighbor we, you know we're your community oh, yeah. everybody's got their own opinion right and i mean it's just like we talked today those are my views of the world uh i might not and, agree with them but that's cool and our industry and it is what it is right uh but I'm more than willing to listen. Trust me, I'm more than willing to live to guys, listen to other other folks that have a different view of it. Or I, I sure know there are lots. Some of those guys are a lot smarter than me. I can tell you that. Yeah. So uh, I, that's another thing in this in that type of environment is really you know you're to listen, watch a lot of news, and try to read a lot of the reports that come out. And there's certain people you really put a lot more stock in with what they're saying yeah. versus versus others. Uh, so definitely try to be a little more well read. Yeah, I'm not a big book reader, but I'll Audible? read. But industry uh, audio book, yes. Man, I try, I'm, trying on, get, I'm trying to get. I'm trying to get into that, YouTube. dude. That's tough. Yeah, I hadn't done the audio book. Oh, I? I tune out. Yeah, no, no. But yet I have a fifteen dollar a month subscription to Audible, oh, yeah. and I can't cancel. Otherwise, it's like you. you, you what are you an idiot? You can't listen to a book? Yeah. Like, come on, JP. Yeah, yeah. it's not the same. It's, it's not, not the, it's it's not the same. It's, it's not the same. It's, it's not the same. But it's like, in, in reality, just like building a sales team or building any type of team, yeah. if you surround yourself with the same people that have the same viewpoint that approach a problem the exact same way or approach, I mean, for example, I think the, one of the best sales teams is when you got, you know, the guy that knows, you know, the, the, the technical sales guy. Yeah. Go no, you got to have them. Yeah. And then you got the guy that, oh man, all I do is, you know, I'll, I'll do meetings, do lunches, but I like taking customers fishing sure. or hunting or yeah. I like doing that. If you, if you surround yourself with the same type of people yeah. you're going to get the same input you're going to get the same approach to a problem or you're going to get the same yeah. discussions i think it's important to kind of diversify Definitely. who you surround yourself with yeah you just got to know your role and what you're good at and be not be able to afraid to admit what you're not good at right and that's the whole thing that's what that's what i enjoyed it at ranger being in that ops role was i knew what my role was is to run the business i let all those superintendents pushers that was their deal. I'll listen, yeah. but give them a voice, give them an empowerment to be able to voice their opinion. And that's big with you, empowerment. It really yeah. is, honestly. Uh, empower for those guys who feel like they're part of something bigger. When did you? Because re- they are. Well, right? when did I you mean, realize that? I guess when it, the you know, importance I think it, of it. It is almost kind of, it kind of naturally happened sitting around our seven a.m. meetings talking about what everything was going on every day and where everybody was uh, in the well service rig business is pretty uh, challenging market as it is. Right. And so it's, we had, I wouldn't, I'm not a micromanager, but we had to literally go through and it paid, it, I felt like it paid dividends for us to do that, but it definitely opened up to a lot of other conversations that any, some challenges we may have been having, but it also let people, uh, you know, we'd be discussing what rigs going here, people, uh, we're going to spend the money. We're not going to spend the money. I knew what my role, I wanted to hear it. I let those guys, you tell me, you're the expert here. You've been doing this, you're 65 years old. You've been doing this a lot longer than I have, right? So you tell me, and if somebody in the room disagrees with you, then we, we need to do it right now. You know, it allows it allows the constructively i mean yes you know it allow, but it allows to have those conversations yeah. and sometimes you don't even realize you need these conversations yeah and that's where kind of the going you know we talked about the the different layers and that engagement and allowing some of these guys to actually make some decisions right but you got to sit in the room with them yeah and, and help guide them be part of it because if you're going to disagree from a business you know a lot of decisions don't make sense 
uh, or they make sense talking about, but on paper when it comes down to the numbers, it may not make sense. Right. So you got to do something different, right? And you got to help them understand that, right? And plus, also, I mean, if if you're not engaging with your employees, you're not empowering them all this stuff, mm-hmm. then you just got people going there. You, what are they, the 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 Picassos where they just draw a paycheck? Yeah. You, know, you want people actually engaged. No with, doubt. With the, they feel like they're skin in the game That's and right. be ambassadors for that for that company. Yeah, no doubt about it. Man. Yeah, no doubt about it. I agree. I think. The more people know what's going, especially whether you're in the back accountant, HR, whatever it is, or sales guy, and that's why I say get engaged in the operations too, but you got to really get engaged in the industry that you're in and and know what's going on and maybe the challenges that you may face, right? Right. Whether it's what, it's simple as what commodity prices are, right? Versus staring at a computer all day and then this is my job this is my job i got blinders on yeah that's that's it it. yeah you know what i mean but the more uh they're engaged in knowing how the business is run or what's going on in the industry you're probably going to get a little more out of them and make them feel a part of that the day-to-day you know what i mean but that's what i mean that we so we so i mean i remember in the summer we're doing some podcasts and all this stuff and people were talking you know you got to create value you got to create value you got to yeah and to me you hear that enough. It's like shit. I've, is that just another buzzword? Is that just a, another buzzword? but that's a, but that's a real life example on how to create value. I mean, your job might be doing you know X, Y, and Z, but man, find out what they're doing in the, you know over there. Find out what they're doing over yeah, there. Yeah, no, talk that, to them about that. That's exactly right, and that's kind of why what I did. The approach that I've always taken is whether I had appointments or not, I would always end up back at the office till later in the day right and i would end up inserting myself and go sit in their office the operations guy's office or be around him when he was on the phone call or or uh, or on a conference call or something if he would yeah. allow me to come in and listen to some of that stuff and you, you're going to learn something you're going to get engaged in what's really going on versus your only interaction with your customer every day right right and uh but i think those guys take note of that it's all about respect in this business in this world and again sometimes your biggest your hardest sales are internally. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's true. They really true. are. That's true. I mean, they really are. So. I mean, that's a great point. Yeah, man. Man, I appreciate you coming in, dude. Uh, I, it's all good. I love hearing your outlook. Love hearing your opinion. Um, wish you were in uh, Houston a lot more. And uh, next time you are, definitely let me know. But, uh, buddy, um, I appreciate everything, man. And uh, thanks for stopping in. And everyone, thanks for listening to uh, Round the Rotary. And, again, this is, uh, this uh, you know, uh, Chief uh, Tozen. And he's uh, – you know, find him on LinkedIn. Um, you can connect with him there and just shoot him a note. Um, just find out uh, a little bit more about him. If you want to have a cup of coffee with him, I mean, we're dying to do that. A cup of coffee, swing some sticks, whatever you want to do. Whatever you want to do. Let's so do so if people are going to swing sticks with you, I mean, where'd you get your handicap? The index is like 6.3. I was always, oh. I always People are like, oh, man, you ought to be really good at golf. Well, until I go get a lesson or lessons – you know, you do the same bad habits, have the same bad habits. They don't go away when you go on the driving range, right? If you, even if you do it every day. You know, I don't want to get good at golf. This is why, because I truly enjoy being the in, worst the, in, the, in, in the last flights of, uh, of, of, of things. It's that's the, where the, all the real that's, fun That's is. where the fun's at. I agree. I that's agree. where the fun's at. That's where the fun's at. All right, buddy. I appreciate you coming in. You have a safe trip back, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, brother.